right, it is seven o'clock. We'll go ahead and get things started. If you please join me, rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silent reflection. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, you may be seated. That moves us into roll call. Mrs. Roberts, you please call the roll. Mr. Bowden. Here. Mr. Hoffman. Here. Mr. Nimmer. Here. Mr. Myers, absent. Mr. Slaughter. Here. That moves us into 1.4 uh, minutes from last meeting. Hopefully everybody's had a chance to look those over. Anybody has any questions or concerns? If not, I need a motion to approve. So moved, Mr. President. Moved by Mr. Hoffman. Can I get a second? Second. Second by Mr. Boat. Mrs. Roberts? Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Boat. Yes. Mr. Kimmer. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Motion passes. Moves to 1.6. Uh, this is another uh, motion to approve minutes uh, from the special meeting on October 2nd. Anybody has any questions, comments? If not, Need a motion to approve. So moved, Mr. President. Moved by Mr. Boat. Can I get a second? Second, Mr. President. Second by Mr. Kemmer. Mrs. Roberts. Mr. Boat. Yes. Mr. Kemmer. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Smelter. Yes. Motion passes. Moves to 1.7. Adjustments to the agenda. No adjustments at this time. Okay. <clears throat> That'll move us into number two, recognition of visitors. I don't believe we have any signed up. And that'll move us into number three, 3.1. Um, business Advisory Council for High School Business. Mr. Bell. Happy to have Ms. Swick with us this evening. And uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to Mr. McPhail and Ms. Swick to uh, introduce this topic. And uh, I put this on the board agenda as a report and presentation tonight. Uh, I didn't want to bring this before, before the board for a vote without uh, Ms. Swift and Ms. McBell being able to present to the board as to what they would uh, like to incorporate at the high school. Uh, after they present, we can have discussion, and then uh, moving forward, we put it on the next board agenda for consideration from the Board of Education. So, Mr. McBell and Ms. Swift, I'll turn it over to you. If you guys can step up towards the microphone, we'd appreciate it. As we've discussed several times in, in uh, different board meetings over the last couple of years, we've really tried to overhaul our, our business program to make it more practical and user-friendly for our students. So when they come out of that program, they've got something tangible and useful. And so uh, I think it was a couple of meetings ago we talked about the fact that this was the, the first year that we've got full implementation of that business pathway. So we're excited about, about uh, where that's led. We've got a couple success stories that Mrs. Swick is going to share with you, and I would just say before I, I turn the microphone over to her, we have asked a tremendous amount out of Mrs. Swick. She's handled it like a champion. Uh, we went into this. There were a lot of unanswered questions and unknowns. Uh, we were doing some work sometimes without knowing exactly where that was going to lead us uh, at various times over the last couple of years, but it's come together nicely, and that's a direct result of all the hard work that Crystal has done and um, just her willingness to be a team player and, and work really hard for our students. So I'm going to turn the floor over to Mrs. Swift. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'd like to first start out by adding, but it's still a work in progress, and it will be a work in progress for quite some time, but we'll get there. Thank you for allowing me to talk a little bit about the, the business pathway. It has undergone many changes in the last five years that I've been at the high school. But I'm excited about the opportunities that the entrepreneurship pathway brings for our students. With the pathway, students are able to complete courses to gain college credit through an articulation agreement with Columbus State. They can get CCP credit through Columbus State and CTAG credit through higher education. Um, this is the first year, as Mr. McPhail stated, that the pathway is fully operational. And we have two students who are going to potentially achieve the following. Student one has completed the pathway and will have 11 Columbus State credits through that articulation agreement. 
You will also have CTAG credit for strategic entrepreneurship, CCP credit for interpersonal skills. So he will potentially graduate, assuming he meets all of the requirements, with 17 hours of college credit. Student number two will have all of those um, previously listed accomplishments, as well as a social media CCP class, um, an industry recognized credential for Google AdWords. So he could potentially leave the end of the school year with 20 college credits. So in the first year that the pathway is fully operational, I think that is pretty amazing. Um, so as part of the pathway requirements, there are two components that we still haven't implemented. Those two components being the business advisory committee and then a career tech student organization. So the business advisory committee members that I am re recommending to the board are Travis Markwood as the president of the Lancaster Fairfield Community Chamber of Commerce. He's a Fairfield Union alumni. Um, he states he's involved in multiple organizations and efforts to encourage young adults to consider these types of um, careers that we're talking about in the business pathway. Mike Pettit, the Lancaster Economic Development Director and the Director of Lancaster Port Authority. He's on OUL's advisory committee for industrial programs and the advisory committee for the new county workforce development center. Dee Smith, she's the client services director for Thomas P. Pappas and Associates. She's a 2018 Hall of Fame inductee of Eastland Fairfield Greer Technical Schools and she provides government relations services for 40 of Ohio's Greer Technical Planning Districts. And then lastly, Heather Yates. She is um, the owner of Action Coach Ohio, is also a Fairfield Union alumni. Her maiden name is Heather Ricketts. And um, she's an internationally recognized business coach and employee engagement expert, ranking in the top 10 in the United States and top 25 worldwide. Okay. The second component that I'm presenting to you today is DECA. DECA was chosen as the TC CTSO because of the opportunities it presents for our students and similarities to our existing student organizations. So the format will be very familiar to both our students and our community as FFA and FCCLA. DECA integrates very nicely into classroom instruction and students will be able to apply learning, connect to business, and um, it promotes competition as well. From the DECA website, their mission statement is to prepare emerging leaders and entrepreneurs in marketing, finance, hospitality, and management. 96% um, of DECA members report they gain skills in problem solving. 90% um, experienced empowered that DECA empowered them to become effective leaders. 87% um, report that participation in DECA prepared them academic for college and or a career. So events within DECA include role play, written and prepared events, and online events. These events are within the four career clusters that I previously mentioned. Last year, I was able to attend the Fall Leadership Com Conference and the District 10 competition to help prepare myself for becoming a chapter advisor this year. I also would have um, attended state, but unfortunately state was the weekend that everything shut down. So they had um, canceled that in the anticipation of this happening. So um, I prepared for you a Fairfield Union DECA constitution and a draft budget. And I'll be honest. I have a copy of that yep. for, to reference. Yep. I saw that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll be honest, the deck or the budget was definitely um, a challenge. And that is definitely a working document. Um, it was very hard to come up with realistic numbers um, because so much has been canceled for this coming year and the uncertainty of what will or will not happen. Um, as I was preparing this information to present to you um, this afternoon, in my capstone class, the, the two students that I have in there, I asked them what they would tell the Board of Education about the business courses if they were here tonight with me. Um, and they stated that they've taken business classes since their freshman year, 
and the business courses um, are relevant to becoming college and career ready, and they see immediate value in the information even as a high school student. So with the addition of the committee and DECA, the value will continue to increase for our students. Do you have any questions for me? <laughs> I think it's a good program. I, mean, oh. I think any type of business course is going to be helpful regardless of what pathway they pursue. So I think the more opportunities they have, the better off our, our students are going to be. So I think it's a great idea. And um, with having CCP opportunities, CTAG opportunities, articulation, there's so many I'm not gonna lie, it's kind of confusing to explain everything, but there, it's not one size fits all. They can choose, choose their path. Very transferable. Yes, yeah. exactly. Second good plan. Anything else? I, I would add, uh, A, I do wanna thank Ms. Swick. I mean, mm -hmm. the amount of time, effort, yeah. energy that has gone into this, as well as Mr. McPhail, Mr. Destadio, uh, several years ago, uh, you know, as a district, we really wanted to focus in on uh, educating the whole child. Not, it's not just about academic standards. It's about finding pathways for kids. What are they going to do after graduation? Whether it's college, career, military, you know, it, there's no wrong way to do it. We just want to make sure we're supporting them. So that was kind of the general charge to the staff and and uh, very quickly Ms. Swick and, and the administration at the high school identified this as a potential program and pathway that could be developed uh, not not only quickly and uh, I say quickly because programs like these just don't come together in a year or two like this one already has where we have kids earning 17 and 20 college credits mm -hmm. uh, so I say quickly even though it's been a year or two because they have moved at a lightning pace to get all this together uh, but uh, you know it's happened quickly and it's a relevant field uh, uh, so uh, kudos uh, thank you so mm -hmm. much for all of your hard work uh, not only for putting the proposal together tonight but for all you're doing for our kids obviously it's already paying off for these two individuals to have that many college credits before they ever leave our doors is amazing, uh, you know. Uh, it's it's basically a you know, almost a year's worth of credits. Mm -hmm. so, I feel very strongly that the business courses are relevant regardless yeah. of what career field mm -hmm. you are going into, and I very much want to want our students to see it as more than just a graduation requirement. And I think um, this is all going in the right direction. Uh, I would say after tonight, if if you have questions, the more you think about it and mm -hmm. look at what's attached, and I have a couple more documents that that Mr. McF McPhail had submitted to me that I can send your way about the program in general. Um, email Ms. Swick, myself, Mr. McPhail, and if you have questions, and we'll get those to you, and uh, then we can <coughs> have more discussion November 2nd at the next board. Ms. Swick, I'm impressed with the committee members you came up with. I mean, it's nice to have yeah. the for you connections there um, for the kids to, to look up to and you know and see what they've done um, so that's very impressive with the I was staff. very happy as that came together as well I think <laughs> that those um, four individuals are very well connected and in tune with our local community and will be mm -hmm. able to um, mm -hmm. really help our students as well that is a very strong group um, just a question Obviously, these students are already taking some of these courses. What's the, how many numbers do we have out there that are interested in pursuing this farther if this is all approved? Have you got any idea? In terms of DECA for well, this year? Well, both, actually. I mean. My challenge at this point is getting students and their parents to understand the different articulated agreement, CTAG, CCP. They know CCP, but they don't necessarily know yet 
the articulation agreement or the CPEG credit. So um, that is still being developed. And I think that the group that I have of seniors this year are very much going to help me recruit those younger students. Because we've already been um, talking about that, working on that this entire semester. So I unfortunately can't give you a number. Well, no, but it just, I, I would think it'd be very attractive to a lot of students. And I would hope the parents would see value in it too to kind right. of push them in that direction. Absolutely. Um, and how are, can they start as freshmen taking these courses? Yes. Okay. There are five courses in the pathway. Um, business Foundation, which is like an int introduction to business, marketing principles, digital marketing, strategic entrepreneurship, and capstone. They, they have to take the, um, the four courses, not the capstone, that's like a cherry on top, but the other four. And they take those over a four year period or can they streamline this and take it in they can. two years? Yes. The, um, Business Foundation and Marketing principles are, principles are both semester courses. Um, the other three are year-long courses, but they can um, take it over a couple years. Yes, so <coughs> how awesome is that, that they mm -hmm. could get that many credits that quickly? Yeah. Are there prerequisites there where they have to take one of the year-long courses before the next? They have to take Business Foundation or Marketing principles before they can take one of the year-long courses. And they have to take a semester course and a year-long course before they can take a capstone. So basically they have to be a concentrator in the CTE world before they can take the capstone course. What, what an opportunity, Mr. Belva, you touched on it. What an opportunity for these, these students and, uh, you know, to have offered to them. And, and uh, Mr. Belva said, Ms. Wick. And to you and, and to our administrators uh, to give uh, our students this opportunity. It's true the hats off to you and, and we're thankful for your leadership. It's, it's been a work in progress and even to be able to explain to you as easily as I did, um, as I have, or at least I hope I have, mm -hmm. um, it's I'll, a work in progress. How proud, how proud you got to be of the students, you know, as they succeed and as you see them succeed and uh, with these programs so it was I, I think the week before fair that a light bulb went off and I was sitting there looking <laughs> at student number one and student number two and I was like wait I gotta I have to crunch these numbers and I'm like do you realize <laughs> do you realize where you're at and um, that, that was like one of those even for me complete light bulb moments and I was like okay we gotta work this for you too so um, yeah. I'm glad that in the first year of being fully operational that we're going to see that success. I think you can see what's driving the program. You just look at the passion uh, and the yeah. for what she's doing for the students. I mean, that's, that's what's made this all work. Yeah. I think, to your point, Mr. Hoffman, uh, our challenge is going to be communicating this, uh, of course, to the students in the scheduling process, but to an eighth grade student to be able to uh, understand what this does for Well, Mr. McPhail, I, uh, my advice is let Miss Wick talk to those parents because uh, her, her enthusiasm is really contagious. <laughs> her enthusiasm is real contagious. So, yeah. Well, I, I think that plus maybe a few business partners coming in to sell the value uh, mm -hmm. that goes a long way to show a student that this is this is fully transferable. Uh, there are skills you can take with you for life, regardless of what pathway you take. You may not end up in business, but still good information to Absolutely. have. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. at Business Advisory Council, those are my connections that are going yeah. to be able to help me pull in group. those local people easily. I mean, they've already told me whatever you need. So I said, first step is I got to get, I got to get you approved. Mm -hmm. So I, I, those are worker bees on that group. So yeah. Good, good mm -hmm. bunch. 
Where, um, this is a detailed question, but I think it's so exciting also coming from most of my background being in business and retail. Absolutely. What you're saying is so interesting to me because mm -hmm. clearly like everybody's saying it's real world experience. I mean, yeah. the things are so transferable. My detailed question is in your budget, and I trust me, <laughs> on the, my side of it, I really appreciate that. Where are you getting the um, revenue for this year? There's like $4,000, $4,400 of revenue. That's a fund transfer. There is a Business Professional of America previous club. Okay. That I'm um, asking that that become the DECA starting Got it. fund. So that club will no longer be in existence, essentially. Yes. Okay. I have that in the Constitution okay. that any former members would then become alumni okay. of the DECA Got club, it. and that those funds will be transferred to the DECA. Okay. And I, I would say, I don't think we've had the Business Professionals of America, at least for the last five years. I don't think we've had that since I've been here. Well over five, I'm not sure. Okay. No, that, did not, that has not existed in the five years that I've been here okay. either. Thank you, Mr. Swick. I right. appreciate it. I, I would say I would say two things. Uh, number one, towards the end of the year, we'd love to have those two students come and maybe present to the board about their experiences in the program. Uh, if you if you guys can help me remember to invite them, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, kind of filling in some of the blanks leading up to this program. Uh, this is all kind of like putting a jigsaw puzzle together. And really, we, we're starting this, hopefully laying a foundation at the middle school through our career exploration classes. And we'd love to see uh, Ms. Phillips, who's doing great work with that class, get tied into this somehow, because I, I think she could be a, a vehicle for you to build mm -hmm. interest and mm -hmm. kind of showcase what can happen and bring in some of these business leaders speak to that class as well as yours. Actually, I met with her right before we closed down Fantastic. last year because I was going to try to coordinate coming over yeah. here to talk yeah. to those classes right. myself. Yeah. Yes. No, that's fantastic. Yes. So I, <laughs> I'm sure Ms. Hong would be more than happy to facilitate that as well. So. I, I was just Perfect. Idea. <laughs> I, I, it doesn't take a lot. I'm not surprised to hear that you were ahead. Just this time, though, not, no. not always. I'm no, not you're, gonna, you're about ten in this situation. You're about 10 steps ahead. No, no. no. <laughs> I appreciate it, Ms. Swift. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. And Ms. Swick, uh, thank you for being here. Completely understandable if you want to take off. We know you've had a long day, a long right. week ahead. So Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. So that moves us to 3.2 uh, administrative reports. Mr. Belbell. Uh, as always, appreciate our mm -hmm. uh, principals and, and Mr. Myers coming to board meetings to give updates on things happening in the buildings or upcoming uh, events at each building. So uh, I'm going to have Ms. Myers come forward first. I think, to, I think uh, you volunteered for it. Go for it. <laughs> Just want to get you up to date on a few things. First of all, uh, you know, Mrs. Swick obviously, obviously did an obvious uh, and an excellent presentation. Don't know if you realize or not, Mike Pettit, who she mentioned, is married to Cheryl Pettit, who taught here at Fairfield Union for a number of years. So I don't know if you made that connection. Uh, update on VLA. Uh, we have 321 students uh, in the VLA program at this time. And oddly enough, Bremen and Pleasantville, Bremen has 55, Pleasantville has 63, pretty, pretty similar. Uh, the middle school has 101 students and the high school has 102 students. So the, the upper grades are also uh, pretty similar. Uh, remember, the VLA students will have an opportunity to come back to in-person learning uh, beginning the second grading period. And then any students that are doing in-person learning will have an opportunity to go to VLA. Uh, we set that up at the beginning of the year. Uh, they need to let uh, us know about that uh, by Monday, the 26th, and again, that will go into effect the second grading period, which is November 2nd. Also, uh, third grade, we have testing this week, and I'm sure Mrs. Miller and Mr. Ripple will expand on that a little bit. Uh, our VLA students, we're going to have them come in on Friday to do testing. We've invited them in, and remember, the other students are doing remote learning that day. 
uh, so that gives them an opportunity to get our full attention as we go through uh, third grade testing. So again, just wanted to give you an update on that, uh, where we're at with VLA and some upcoming uh, testing that's gonna take place. And with that, I'll turn it over to the principals. Mr. Fair. <clears throat> Again, just uh, really, really proud of, of Mrs. Wick and the work that she's done. And, and uh, just in general, you know, we, in our last meeting, uh, we were talking about kind of where we were at in each of the buildings, and uh, things continue to go pretty smoothly at the high school, we're kind of in, kind of in uh, a rhythm. Uh, there are challenges, but I just wanted to, to publicly thank and recognize the entire teaching staff, custodial staff, for continuing to just, you know, it, it, uh, in many ways is, is a grind on our teachers. This is tougher than, than just typical, uh, a typical school year. And um, uh, sometimes, you know, they'll come, and, they'll come and, and have concerns and we listen to those concerns, but, but they're going back into classrooms and really doing good hard work to try to reach every single one of our students. And so um, just really, really thankful for the work that they're doing. Uh, as, as we all know, we just came off of a fair break and, you know, we have students that, that are involved in, in the fair in so many ways through so many different organizations. Uh, so we're, st we're still compiling, our ag department is still compiling all the statistics from that from last week. But they do have the stats, or they did have the stats from our students who were participating directly through our ag and FFA program. So we had 15 students that participated, uh, nine first place finishes, two second place finishes, and four third place finishes in their various um, animal showing opportunities in the fair last week. Uh, this is kind of we're wrapping up fall sports season and getting ready to, to ramp up winter sports season. There's an overlap there. Just to give you a quick rundown on uh, where we're at from the fall, our volleyball team, uh, they'll travel to Jackson, Jackson High School this Wednesday to, to play Jackson. That's a 6 p.m. game. Uh, they were 7-15 on season, 5-9 and nine in the Mid-State League this year. Our boys soccer team, they'll travel to a sectional tournament at Logan Elm High School. That's Thursday at 5 p.m. Boys were 7 7 and 1 overall, 3 3 and 1 in the Mid State League. Our girls' soccer team, uh, they, try, they play Saturday. They'll host here at 11 a.m. here at home. Opponent to be determined at this point. Uh, they were 15 and 1 on the year, 7 0 in the Mid State League in the Buckeye Division champions. Very, very talented group. Uh, big opportunities ahead of that ball club. Hmm. Our cross country teams, uh, the district is this Saturday, Southeastern High School. That's at 2 p.m. Both our boys and girls cross country teams finished fourth place in the Mid-State League Buckeyes past Saturday. We hosted that uh, Buckeye Division meet here this year, and that's a rotating basis uh, throughout the league over the years. Our football team is 1-7. Uh, and seven. They're 1-5 and five in the Mid-State League. They travel to Utica for a 7 o'clock kickoff Friday night. Boys golf team finished their season at 18-5 and five in the Mid-State League. They were second in the Mid-State League. Josh Tipton was the Mid-State League Player of the Year. Our girls golf team, amazing growth in that program over a, over a three-year period. 11-9 um, in the Mid-State League, they, they finished third in the league, which to me is outstanding. You know, we had, we had um, I think the first year, three players maybe, and you know, that's grown and continues to grow, and I think that, you know, uh, Coach has done a tremendous job with, with building that program. Last spring, typically our Honor Society induction is in the spring, so uh, clearly we were not able to do that last spring. So we're in the middle of that selection process right now. Um, Honor Society students have to be, it should be an incoming junior or senior. So it's the group from last year, so there are juniors and seniors this year. That process is being done digitally. We have 40 students who made application to be considered for the National Honor Society. Um, have to have a 3.5 GPA, have to have been a student here for at least a semester before you can, you can be considered to be in, in the group. And then, of course, the last three criteria, service leadership and character. So we're in the part, uh, digital, digital applications were sent out to all of the students, every student in the high school, and you know, they apply based on uh, whether they want to be considered or not. And then, of course, screen those applications to make sure that they meet the academic criteria uh, and the um, the uh, semester criteria. So we do have a faculty council then that takes the people that kind of make it through the first cut and then the faculty council kind of looks at each of those students individually and they consider their uh, leadership abilities, their, their service component,
and what they bring to the table as a whole person, and uh, that's how the final recommendations for the National Honor Society get made. We have tightened that, that process down quite a bit the last couple of years. We feel like that that group should be an elite group. National Honor Society should represent, again, your best and brightest, and, and um, we have so many very talented students at Fairfield Union High School, but uh, the process is, is, is pretty tight right now, so it does mean something. So the students that come out of this, if all 40 of these students uh, are selected, they have something to really be proud of. We have, we're, we're piloting, um, one of the challenges, and, and again, we've alluded to this kind of ongoing, one of the challenges with our virtual, our full-time virtual students, and when we're in our hybrid model, you know, the students that were on part of the time, it can be very challenging on many levels for those students to, to be able to effectively get their work done, and there's a lot of reasons for that. But we needed a way to, we felt like we needed a way to try to separate um, what is attendance from what is academic challenges that you know, we want to address with, with interventions as opposed to you know, students that maybe just are, are not doing what they're supposed to do and, and logging in and, and making an effort. And so we're piloting at the high school. Uh, as a matter of fact, we got the first report this morning. There were 65, 66 students on the report. And um, <clears throat> it's, it's a pretty simple process, but our teachers just at the end of each week we have a little Google form and there's just three questions on there, and if the students haven't turned any work in at all, then the teacher sends that name to us via Google form. That goes into a spreadsheet, and then we can sort it. That happens on a Friday at the end of the day. We sort the spreadsheet on Monday, and what we're capturing there, what we're attempting to capture is students that haven't turned any work in at all. So to us, that is a lack of digital attendance, if you're not tr trying. Now, if they're turning work in and it's, it's um, you know, they're having academic challenges or it's substandard work, we're going, to, we're going to address that through our intervention process. If they'll log into our Google Meets, if they'll reach out to the teachers, we feel like that we can get them the help that they need to be able to get their work done. So we're piloting this process, um, you know, we've had conversations with our, with our fellow administrators, and so if this, after a couple of weeks here, if, we, if this looks mm -hmm. like it's going to work, then this is something we're going to, you know, maybe have conversations with. Uh, at a, at a district level. So I just wanted to let you know that that is, we have started to do that. And, um, you know, I'm optimistic that it might give us a pretty basic, but I think it'll give us a tool to be able to, to make some uh, targeted decisions, if you will, about how to handle certain circumstances. Uh, one, we talked about uh, CTAG and, and career opportunities tonight. And uh, part of our program at the high school, of course, is you know, our relationship with uh, Eastland Fairfield Career Center, that's a very vital part of getting our students what they need for their next phase after high school. That's a big, big thing for me and, and kind of uh, we want our students to be able to have opportunities, whatever they are. As Mr. Belleville alluded, you know, if you want to go on to uh, pursue a professional degree or a medical degree, we need to be able to have the uh, structure in place to give those students what they need to be able to successfully do that. If you want to be able to, to move on and run your own business, we need to be able to give the students what they need to successfully do that. So part of that process is, you know, we've got to get students in, in the right places, and that, that requires some communication. Well, Fairfield Career Center, East Fairfield Career Center is a very vital partner to us in that regard, and uh, we typically have 40 to 60 students a year that, that attend the Career Center to, to go through their program in their junior, senior year. I'm long-windedly getting to the fact that the challenge is typically we send them there to visit so that they can be exposed to the programs. Well, we can't do that in this, in this uh, COVID environment, so we've made arrangements for the Career Center people to come to us. We're going to do a digital version. Uh, we'll get our sophomores in the auditorium. They're going to have some snacks, and so they'll watch a presentation. It'll be a video presentation. Then while they have their snacks, the Career Center staff will be able to uh, do question and answer and, and uh, you know, try to give the students as much information as they can in that period of time. We're going to do that on uh, November 16th, which, which is a Monday. I put it on here. We just scheduled it today. So uh, that's something that will be upcoming. I did, uh, lastly, I wanted to do a, a quick shout out also to our music program. Um, you know, we've had, we've had uh, Mr. Savage, Mr. Gregory, and Mrs. Howe uh, have all done tremendous work this year. Um, uh, and Mr. Gregory coming in new. We've asked a lot of him. He's got a lot on his plate as a first-year teacher, and he's just taken it on like a true champion. Uh, I think if you've had the opportunity to, to uh, see our marching band this fall, 
They've made tremendous strides, very, very encouraged about what we're seeing with that. Um, so uh, I wanted to give a shout out to that group as a whole. Mr. Gregory's doing uh, through the choral department. He's doing some very creative work, maybe with an opportunity. I have him in later in the year to, to report to you about what he's done with um, digital choral. He's got a, a digital program. The students can record themselves and then they all send it in and he puts it together and, and make, can make a concert out of it basically. So that's going to be really interesting to see how that goes. But just I wanted to do a shout out to them. They're doing a lot of good work and uh, good energy in that department right now. So. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> questions for Mr. Well, the biggest question I had was how the, the Friday afternoon group of kids were doing, you know, struggling to get through the virtual part of this whole mess. Uh, we all know it's a challenge. Uh, and, and are they actively logging in? Are they being busy? Are they doing the work that they're supposed to be doing? Or are they just simply sliding by and not doing anything and assuming they're going to get credit for it? So I, I think that's the ultimate challenge. You know, the, and <clears throat> to answer your question, I mean, it's certainly it's a mixed bag, but we have way too many students that are getting themselves in, in a bad position because they're not logging into the computers and doing their work. <clears throat> um, we've got a lot of students that are doing a really nice job of it, but, uh, you know, you've got, a, you've got over 100 high school students who, you know, got to have 23 credits to graduate. You got to get your you got to get your core credits, and you know you just can't afford to lose a year, and you know and, and so it's a it's a huge concern, and again we'll we'll continue to communicate, you know how our processes are working, but it's it is it is a challenge. Uh, distance learning is is tough in the best case scenario, and so mm -hmm. I, I would agree with that. I I have to say my kids are pretty decent students, but. They have struggled in that online environment. I know my son, when he has online from home every week, he was more stressed out than when he was here in, in session. Uh, my daughter at the college level is having the same issues. It's just, it's lonely sitting in front of a computer all day, and even the most driven student has trouble staying focused. So, uh, you know, there's no excuse for a kid not doing anything but certainly even some of the best students are struggling in this environment and, and I applaud the teachers for recognizing that and continuing to work with the students to give them chances, extended deadlines, whatever it takes to get the work done. So, It's really one of the reasons we wanted to do this little pilot we're doing because it felt like administratively our teachers were looking to us, you know, they're, 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 they're sending emails, they're making phone calls, they're reaching out and they're, you know, and they're just, they want these students to be successful so then they look to us and like, what do we do next? We don't know what to do. So we, we're trying to we're trying to do as much as we can to support them. The, the challenge is it's not you don't get immediate feedback. You know the students it's there they're doing their work. If they hit a wall, they're going to have to wait to get the answer. So that process just gets strung out. It's very challenging. Any other questions? And Mr. Buck, kind of answer yours a little bit and build on what Mr. McPhail say. Obviously, our teachers are the first line of defense to make sure kids are engaged in their, like Mr. McPhail pointed out, they're sending emails, they're making phone calls. Uh, Marcy Wesselhoff, our uh, uh, attendance officer, is making home visits, uh, and she's doing just, I mean, amazing work. Uh, and then past that, our administrators are making phone calls, trying to make contact. So it, it's not just one thing, it, it's multiple layers to try to make contact and reach out to those students who are not engaged, uh, whether it's teacher, administration, or utilizing the attendance officer. So um, you know, we're, we're trying to do all we can. Uh, kind of along those lines as well, we have bus drivers that are doing amazing work as well. They know a kid is engaged. I've had bus drivers making phone calls to households and, hey, what, how can I help? What do you need? Those type of things. So, you know, we're making efforts to reach them every way possible. All right. Thank you, Ms. McPhail. Ms. Hahn. Good evening. Um, just a little, few little things that I have to share um, about the middle school. Um, most recently, Edie Schilling 
Our, um, one of the hats that she wears is our gifted um, coordinator. Um, she has just completed a lot of gifted testing, rescreening some of our um, students, especially in our sixth grade level, who um, had tested um, high, but they didn't actually qualify back in the sp um, spring when they had tested. So she's done a series of rescreens with them, and I'm happy to announce that we have several of our middle school students now um, who are um, qualified um, in, in various areas of academics um, in, with our gifted program. Um, she's also doing a training on October 30th um, at the end of the month, um, one of our Fridays, uh, with our teachers to write what are called WEPs and WAPs. And um, those are required um, for the students who do receive gifted services. And so um, our teachers will be receiving that training from her and then um, you know, fulfilling that required paperwork for our students as they do receive those services um, as gifted students. Um, our athletics are also kind of finishing, um, you know, here we have our volleyball um, has completed its season. Um, we have cross country and football who have one more contest this week. Um, and as Mr. McPhail alluded, open gyms are already beginning. Um, we had our girls in, you know, after school today and we've had boys in the activity center already. Um, so, um, you know, we're quickly transitioning to our winter sports season. Um, we are um, trying to begin scheduling some of those award banquets. Um, those are going to look a little differently this year, but we want to make sure that we have that opportunity to get mm -hmm. the kids in here so that they um, do get the recognition that they deserve for their fall sports. Um, since our last board meeting where we attended, um, we've had student council elections. And so we now have new elected uh, student council representatives in the middle school. And uh, they met with Mr. Funk prior to fair break to um, plan our red ribbon week, which is next week. Um, so that's a drug awareness week. So each day next week we'll have, um, well, all, all of next week is going to be a theme week. And each day next week we'll have different drug awareness types of activities um, that our students will um, all be a part of while they are here um, next week. Um, we also, another thing that I'm excited about, um, Mr. Miller, uh, our eighth grade social studies teacher, he is incorporating um, a Veterans Day slideshow um, into his curriculum and kind of a project for his eighth grade students right now. Um, due to our situation right now, we're not really going to be able to have a full-blown Veterans Day assembly, um, which is near and dear to me. I, 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 um, my dad and my son are both veterans, so um, I'm thrilled that he's going to be able to provide that. Um, so he has sent out information for um, staff and um, students to complete a, slide, a piece of a slideshow. And then he's going to put that all together with his students so that our students will have that um, as part of a Veterans Day recognition. Um, we also have um, our Math Counts competition and our Power of the Pen competition that's starting to get geared up. Those two are going to look different this year. Both of them will be virtual, of course. Um, but I was talking with Mr. Burke today, and he was actually pretty excited because, because it is virtual, he's going to be able to um, include a lot more students. Typically, he only has you know, a handful of students that can participate in that competition. But because it is virtual, he can actually invite 60 kids to participate and be a part of that this year. So that is, that's definitely a plus. Um, for, the, for that competition. Um, and then one last little thing I wanted to speak about was our um, Success Maker program. Um, it's a new program that we have, an intervention program that we have for our, um, our, our math students who struggle. Um, it is a computer um, program, an online program. And um, we have right now 21 of our fifth graders, 17 sixth graders, 24 seventh graders and 22 of our eighth graders who are involved in that program. And this program um, runs through the students through a series of assessments so that it can um, totally um, you know, gauge where their um, learning gaps are in math. So it, it then builds a program and a series of lessons for them to um, get various interventions. Um, and so uh, Mr. Faulkner um, is our teacher who is running that program right now with the students. And um, I'm really excited to see 
where this is going to take our kids and how much growth they're going to make. I know it's very early um, in the year, but um, this is a year-long process that the kids will be in. So, um, like I said, I'm just really excited to see what growth they'll make over the year, you know, with using this program. Have any questions or anything? I have one question. My eyebrow come up with the power of the pen. Um, a little bit of just a summary of what's oh, that one yes. tales. Sorry, I kind of skipped over that. I apologize. Yeah. Yes, power of the pen is a writing competition. So students are um, tasked with writing essays, and um, so they're given a prompt and so forth, and they they would be writing about that. Erin Lorridge is our person in charge of that program. She's our teacher in, pro in charge of the program. And um, typically it starts out more at like a local level where they would go um, to a school nearby in Central Ohio and from there the students would progress to a more of a competition at a college level. Mm. Um, and um, we did have two students last year who progressed to that, um, to, the, to the college level, you know, to, to continue on with that. So. Um, it's it's a writing competition for our students here at the middle school. Thank you. Yeah, sounds interesting. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Ms. Hahn. And uh, we'll have, uh, let's see, Mr. Ripple next. Good evening. See everybody again. Got a mini version of Mr. Myers here. <laughs> but um, as he mentioned, Mr. Myers mentioned uh, our third grade testing is this Wednesday, and we start that process uh, with third grade guarantee and everything. I'm um, doing it a little different. We're testing typically in, in the past. They've done one test one day and then another test the second day. Uh, this time around, we're doing a little different and having both tests on the same day. So. A lot of that has to do with our VLA kids coming in on Friday as well to make sure everything's equal, everything's the same. So we have that going on. We have Red Ribbon, Red Ribbon Week next week as well. Um, we're both elementary, so kind of planning that, making sure we're coordinated with that. Um, we're going to have a good time. I think it'll be a, a nice little way to end the quarter, um, a little, have a little extra fun at the elementary level, and um, hopefully a little less stress for the teachers and everything to, to kind of have some fun with things. and and have a good theme behind it. I'm trying to coordinate it all, along with, uh, with trick or treat and all that kind of stuff, which is a good time. Um, I know Ms. Hunter and I also are working on our Veterans Day. I'm talking with Ms. Elliott to try and trying to coordinate that as well. Um, and we have conferences coming up in November on 17th and the 23rd. So other than that, um, the daily adventures are, are always happening. Um, again, you all are more than welcome to hop in if you would like and, and see what's going on. We got every day is something new. Um, I've got stories of uh, our fair week. Um, I was told one of our elementary kids um, had a grand champion chicken, I believe. So I was, <laughs> was kind of interested to see this chicken. <laughs> but, uh, I'll get more information for you on that. But um, we're having a good time. Um, I get a lot of updates on our sports, our youth sports. Um, you know, I got a couple kids playing for the Raiders and a couple kids playing for the Chiefs. Um, so you know, we get all those kind of updates, future Falcons program so uh, that's that's all I got for right now so uh, if you have any questions how are the teachers handling agreement with the VLA students and stress wise and it's a lot of a lot of communications uh, we have a lot of teachers doing Google meets um, at different different times um, I get the opportunity to kind of cover some recesses which is fun to be out there outside obviously not today but uh, to be outside so some teachers can get on and, and meet with their kids, whether it be phone calls or those Google Meets, and kind of encouraging a lot of communication going back and forth between parents and, like I said, phone calls or those mm -hmm. online conversations and some work gets submitted and it's, well, this didn't happen, this didn't happen. And well, when we got a couple situations where parents are, are actually they're taking pictures of the work and it's like, yeah, okay, we're getting done, it's just a some technological issues and things like that. But it is, it is nonstop as far as phone calls and that kind of stuff. I know Bremen probably has as much trouble as anywhere with areas that are not uh, live. So are they struggling through those? Are those kids coming to town? We're getting a lot of kids that are actually coming to the parking lots. 
Um, we've got a, I know we've got a couple families that they're coming in on a, on a Friday afternoon. Um, they're coming into the parking lot. They're downloading all of the, the material on, on PDFs and everything else on their computer. And then when they come back in, they, they'll resubmit it by emails and things like that because their internet, internet connection is not very good. But <coughs> definitely, like I said, a lot of phone calls and, and things like that and making sure we're, we're getting everything as, much, as best we can as, as far as the communication. All right. Mr. Pitt, thank you very much. Hmm. Don't you hate to be last? That's ah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes being first is worse. It just depends. <laughs> so um, good evening. Um, it's always great to be able to come and share some stuff with you that's going on in the elementary buildings. Um, First, though, I would like to say that I am one of four daughters in my parents' family, and three of my sisters were involved in the DECA program. Mm. All of them went different routes in what they chose to do. Um, all of them placed at the state level. One of them placed nationally. Um, it's an amazing program. And I can't tell you why I was the only one that didn't do it, except that I knew from a young age I wanted to be a teacher, so I kind of did more of the child development and those kinds of things instead. And you know, classes, you're limited to what you can take, but um, it's an amazing program. And so we are lucky that we've got somebody that's working to head it up and, and get it going. It's an amazing, amazing thing. So um, we did our um, Apple Teacher Award. We're a couple weeks late getting that, but our winner for this time was Laura Columns. And um, basically, we're using a model just like the middle school, and they shared you know, what they were doing. But teachers have an opportunity to nominate other people in the building. Um, actually, all staff members can nominate anybody. And then we put those nominations together, and then you can vote. And um, she, she won the Apple Teacher, Teacher Award for this time. I wanted to spotlight one of the teachers in our building. And it, her name is Leisha Cottle. She's one of the new kindergarten teachers. And she approached me a couple of weeks ago and said, we like to have a guest reader come to kindergarten, but we haven't been able to ask a lot of people in the community to come for very, you know, obvious reasons that we can't have them in the building. She said, would you be willing to come and be a guest reader? And I thought, oh, of course, I would love to come to kindergarten and be a guest reader. And so I got to come and be their guest reader. Um, I read them a story. They, did, they were doing different things with apples. And um, they had made some few crafts and they had done some counting. Um, and I read this story, and then, um, and you know, and this is a mind of a kindergartner. I think it's important sometimes as adults that we need to remember where these kiddos are at. But they were also learning that apples make applesauce. And so Mrs. Cottle had a crock pot, and she put the apples in, and they had made applesauce, you know, and shared a little with me. She promised me that it was all very sanitary. <laughs> she did all of the putting of the apples into the crock pot and all of that. But. Um, but that was a really neat experience, and it, and it was just neat to see her in action. Um, I was thrilled to be invited to come to the classroom, um, you know, and, and I love kindergarten, so it was, it was just a nice little step back for a moment. Um, on October 6th, our PTO tried a new fundraiser, um, and it was with the Chipotle restaurant um, right up here on Main Street, and they have, it's set up if you bring a certificate or if you have an online um, ordering code, you can get a certain amount of profit back for your organization. And so this was the first time that you know, we were doing anything like this. But I guess um, I, I actually sent Mr. Miller to go get the food. And so I'm getting these reports of how long the lines were and how backed up the traffic was and all of this. But um, it was well worth it. And, we raised almost $1,000 for the PTO. Um, and it wasn't any work except the flyers, you know, or the online code that went home to families or to the VLA parents through an email, um, and then people just supporting that. So that was really a neat, neat thing to do. And I think you can do it every six months, so we're already planning we're going to do it again in the spring um, because it was just a really easy and great fundraiser and seemed to go over very well. So. Um, 
Today, we've had a burst of enrollment at Pleasantville. Um, we had eight new students enroll today. Wow. And we had two that Bremen sent us, so we had 10 <laughs> new students today. So as you can imagine, our office was very busy today as Mary was trying to get records from kids and permanent files set up and you know all of that. And three of those students are third graders. And so we were begging them to start as soon as possible and said, is there any way you could come Tuesday because Wednesday is when we start the testing and we thought that's not a good first day at all. Come in and sit here and take this test and you know, it's just very different from what normally looks like. And unfortunately, all three of those students are not able to come on Tuesday. They can't come until Wednesday. So their very first day is going to be a testing day, which is not ideal, but um, you know, each of them, some of them were still living out of boxes uh, mm. from the house they had just moved into and, and that type of thing. One of them hadn't actually even moved their stuff yet from Lancaster, but they purchased a home in Pleasantville, and so a variety of different reasons. But, um, and as Jeff mentioned, we are doing the testing Wednesday. We're doing a morning and an afternoon session. Um, we'll see how it, it works. We needed to do that this year because of the VLA students um, and to try to keep things um, as equitable as possible with the students and how we had to do it. Um, you know, we'll see what the statistics look like from that. It, I think as I think about it as an educator and I think many of the teachers are thinking it, it's going to be difficult because that's a long day of testing and a long day to sit there, but, um, you know, if there's a time to try it, I guess this is the year, you know. <laughs> so that's how we're looking at it and, uh, you know, we'll take from it what we can. Um, we are also doing the Red Ribbon Week things. Um, and we have some fun things planned. Um, we get to do a couple of fun dress-up days where we do hats and uh, crazy socks and things like that. Um, and then the last day will be uh, the kids can do a costume um, in the afternoon that they can pull over top of whatever they have worn. Um, and our goal is hopefully it won't be raining. Um, we typically do an indoor parade, but that obviously is not a safe idea. So our plan was to go and do the whole perimeter around the Pleasantville playground so that everybody can at least see the other costumes since they like that, but it would be a safe way to do it. Um, so that is kind of what we have uh, in mind for that. So, and that is all I have. Any questions? Well, thank you, Ms. Miller. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, I want to say thank you to all the principals that you know, appreciate them being here. It's a long day. They have, you know, have a long day tomorrow as well. So do appreciate you taking time to be here. And as always, if, if you want to take off, that's fine. Uh, completely understandable. Um, on the third grade test, one thing I want to add, mm -hmm. uh, we, we do have our VLA students coming in on Fridays who are kind of wanting to replicate the same experience for all third graders taking the test. And one of the reasons we're doing everything in one day Mm -hmm. But the other piece of that very much is COVID related. Uh, you know, we could plan on doing half the test Wednesday, half the test Thursday, but we could get a call Wednesday night from the health department and say, hey, listen, you need to mm -hmm. shut a building down because mm -hmm. of exposure for the next 14 days. Well, the high department of education says you have to do this testing on five consecutive dates. And there, there's no leeway with that. Uh, they did give us the option to do wraparounds, so we're going Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday as our five consecutive days, but you're running a, you're running a huge risk mm -hmm. of if you, you've got to do the testing while you have, mm -hmm. uh, just in case something would pop up. Mm -hmm. So kind of another layer to that situation. So, but, all right. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, moves us into section four, 4.1, financial items. This is Roberts. Okay, so I have two items this evening. I have our financial report for the month of September and then also our insurance report. So um, I'm going to start with the financial report. Both are attached to the agenda. Um, and to be honest, for the financial report, I do not have a lot of updates for this month. We are kind of trucking along as expected. We have not had any major shifts since I reported on the financials from August. Um, our next big thing is we obviously will receive our next round of income taxes this month. 
-hmm. So that's a big deal to see if we do catch up at all. Uh, just a reminder, our first round of income taxes, we were down 21% from last year. However, we know a big piece of that was just because the tax due date was pushed back. Um, the income taxes from withholdings to withholdings, so what we could compare apples to apples, um, was down about 7%. Our had the forecast it down 4%. So if we catch that back up, um, which that are, is the predictions that we will catch that back up for October, at least that's what kind of everybody in the tax world is saying for right now. Um, so we'll see what happens this month. So that'll be the next big thing as far as revenue um, to come in. Looking at expenditures, um, overall benefits have really been flat last year, which I'll get into that um, more with an insurance. Um, purchase services are down 28% last year, which we were seeing the same thing um, in August. The one call out I do have is for supplies and capital. Um, so far, if I look at the year, three months into the year, if the budget is accurate, we should have spent about 25% of our budgets, 25% of the year. We have already spent about 37% of our supplies budget, so we are trending high in this area. I have to say I'm not surprised because when I did the forecast back in May, we knew we were pushing this area because we had the um, curriculum purchase, we moved our um, Chromebooks into supplies versus uh, PI. So we knew these things. I was trying to make it work and not mm -hmm. increase our supply budget significantly. Um, unfortunately, we are trending high. Uh, so come our November forecast, this is something I'm going to have to increase, um, which means that would eat into our overall cash balance for the end of the year. Mm -hmm. um, but looking at individual purchases, there's nothing, it's not like there's one major thing that's oversetting it other than those two things that I met. So I think we're, we're on track. It's just <clears> that we're coming in higher, but it, I'm not surprised considering what I had to forecast back in May. Um, the only other thing that looks off to last year is the transfers out. It's down almost 33% to last year, but this is solely due to income tax being down because we transfer 0.75% of our 2% income tax we transfer it out to pay off debt. And since income tax was down, that obviously was also down. So what will hopefully happen is when income tax levels itself out come October, our next round of transfers out would also even ourselves out. So as an expenditure, it looks like, oh, we didn't spend as much in this area, but it's just due to the fact of how transfers work. So um, we will see that. Uh, I don't know if I'll have full results of it by the 11 2 board meeting, but we'll see that uh, in the next few, few weeks. Um, overall, if I look at revenues to expenditures, we our expenditures did exceed revenues for the month by $791,000. However, that's pretty typical just because it's not a huge revenue month since we don't have any taxes or anything coming in. Um, we are in the positive by, for the year by almost $2 million for July through September. We're up about $500,000 from last year. Um, so again, a piece of that though is the transfer uh, out that we haven't seen. So we'll kind of see how that shakes out over the next month. And then cash balance. Um, right now our cash balance is a little over $13 million. Um, last year at the same time, we were right at about 11, 12 million. So we are up 1.3 million. Um, we are forecasting the year to end at 11.9 versus 11.4. Um, however, I will say, why we're forecasting to be up, it's always we're preparing for something unknown, like the pandemic. So um, we'll kind of see some more of that. I know, um, you know, we're really, really paying attention to what we're spending this year and making sure we're only spending on the absolute necessities and really being cautious of that this year. So um, also the next few years, we actually start to go negative. So anything that we can do to spend, say this year will really help to set us up in the next few years. So. Well, it looks a little high. We're really preparing ourselves for the future. Um, I'm not going to dive into the balance of these pages unless anybody has any questions. I'd be more than happy to run through anything. Okay. Um, I will move on to the next report, which is our insurance report. Um, this is the first time this year since we've changed insurances that I'm presenting this format of the report again. I will say that this is probably the first month that we can truly say our interns is starting to smooth out as far as, um, you know, at first we kind of had a lag of claims just due to switching insurances. We were waiting for any um, 
kind of the rollover of endurance, all of those pieces. So this is really the first month that we can really say, okay, we're finally starting to email. So if I first focus on the health insurance piece, what we call premiums versus now is essentially our insurance revenue since we are self-funded. So this is what we are paying the district in order to be able to pay out all of our bills. We are up 39% the last year, which is about $417,000. There's two things that this is made up of. One is that when we moved insurances, we had to hold off on one of our payments, on one of our payments to the district, so one piece of revenue. So it fell into this year. That was about $322,000. The balance is that you remember when we left SEOIC, we received a check from them from the balance that was with them. $95,000 of that balance was deposited into our health insurance um, fund. So between those two things, between the shift of when we essentially withheld payment and then when we um, received the $95,000, that's what's making up the 417. Um, the big thing is, is we did not change rates from last year. So it's not like this is due to a rate increase. We have not had a significant change in membership. So it's really just due to those two things of what's happening. Um, if I look at total expenditures, mm -hmm. we decreased the month by $200,000 or 16%. There's a few things playing into this. One, we know that we were expecting about 30% lower medical costs with UHC, and then also some of it due to COVID. Um, what we have been told is that most people are seeing claims come back about 90 to 95% of last year, and that COVID really is kind of starting to not play a huge factor in people not going to the doctor at this point. So. I actually feel really good about this down 16% because I think it's a true savings mm -hmm. versus the savings it was maybe just due to a slowdown of people not going to the doctor. <coughs> uh, the big thing is that our cash balance in our health insurance um, um, fund, we're ending the month at just under $1.5 million. Last September, we were at a negative $255,000 when we were at the SEOIC. So you can see it's over a $1.5 million swing. Um, and really that was because, you know, last year going into the year, they had a huge increase of 18% in premiums. So they kind of, you know, the district started off the year a little rocky, increased premiums and was able to fund um, some of those increases. So over the year through those increased premiums and then making the change going into this year, we were able to level that out. So we do have a healthy balance. This is where we need to be since we are self-funded. Um, Last month, you know, we, we were a little over. Our runoff claims were higher. This month, runoff claims are starting to settle down. They were about $40,000. Ideally, by the time we get through the end of December, we will have no more runoff claims from our old insurance. Um, and it'll just be claims fully on UHC. So overall, health insurance is in a very good spot. Um, again, UHC has been great partners. I have really good call. We have a call every other week with them just to make sure things are running smoothly. Um, we've had a few large claims that they have been on top of. Um, we are looking at some well, potential wellness programs to, you know, no time soon, but possibly next year, look at going into. So we're already kind of starting to look at what's next and what can we do to um, really look at kind of the health of our employees and then also what we can do next year going into insurance. Um, any questions on the health piece of it before I jump into dental? We have a lot of moving parts still with premiums, but I think as you'll see the next few months, it's gonna kind of start evening mm -hmm. out, and I think it'll kind of just be back to mm -hmm. normal, <coughs> if you can kind of use that word loosely. I'm thinking, Jim and Kevin, you can probably back me up with this. Weren't we, probably three, four years ago, maybe five, carrying like a $2 million balance in the healthcare account, so that, that looks more like it should. Yeah. Or used to? Yeah. Five, Which is five great. years ago. When I came in, we were at two million. Two million. That's okay. And you really need to be sitting with our size that is recommended right mm -hmm. around the one five to one seven ish right. is mm -hmm. really where it's recommended to kind of carry. Right. That way it protects you in case you do have a bad year. Mm -hmm. um, you may have a few high claims. We do have our stop loss at $100,000. So if any one member hits that, that's when we start getting reimbursed. Um, we have had. We have had that already this year. Um, mm -hmm. So it's good that that insurance is in place essentially on our insurance plan. Mm -hmm. um, so, but yes, that is definitely a much healthier number. Um, to be honest, I would like to see it a little higher. 
um, just to protect ourselves a little more. But I definitely, obviously, feel much better about that, even from when we were coming into this year. So um, I think the good news is it's also kudos to our employees as we really look at, you know, how are we, when are we going to the hospital? What are we doing? Are we going to the doctor versus urgent care versus the hospital? And how are we using those, um, you know, different medical services? The virtual visits right now are obviously a, a major thing. And how are we using those versus going to the hospital or ER? So those are the things that are ultimately going to help us to keep our premium down. And as we look into rates for next year, those are the things that will really help us contain those rates and not have to go back to an 18%. Um, okay, dental insurance. Same kind of thing if we look at premiums, that's really our revenue, so that's the, the board percentage as well as employee percentage. We increased 200% to last year. We're, uh, we are basically, last year going into this month, we are at $56,000. Again, a big piece of that, $91,000 of this was our check from SCOIC, so that's where that major increase is coming from. It's not that rates went up, it's not that membership went up, it's really just that balance that's coming over. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a very healthy cash balance of $172,000 versus $72,000 last year. So again, you can see that major, major increases from the $91,000 check. Um, our expenditures have decreased by 51% or $36,000. Honestly, this is due to having a dental network. We have not had one in the past. So now that we are with Delta Dental, we knew that this would be one area to see major savings, um, not only for the district, but for employees. So really having that network is really paying off um, and really being able to take advantage of, you know, a bigger network like Delta Dental. So again, overall, I feel very good about insurance. Um, we will probably start looking at rates for next year, early spring. Um, obviously going to negotiations for this coming year, it's, it's all part of it. So we'll be looking at big picture of um, insurance and where we want to take it and what we need to do to continue funding the plan, um, but feeling pretty good about it. So from here go forward, we will be back to this format, um, especially now that we're seeing things level out a little bit and really able to look at more compared to where we've been in the past. Any questions on insurance? I know we were maybe uncharted waters. Where would you like to see the cash balance? Quarter? In, in, dental, in dental, we're fine. We this is a very healthy cash balance. Um, if we can keep it, if we can keep it at this level, we uh -huh. will be in a good spot. Um, for our, for a district of our size, I mean, it's a healthy cash balance, so okay. I think we're good. Um, okay. You know, I, I don't, I don't want to see it decrease because you never know when you're going to have that yeah. year. But we are, we're in very good shape. Okay. Okay. To be honest, if we didn't have that piece of that $91,000, that check that came back, um, you know, it might be a little bit of a different story. I think I'd be a little more on edge of just, we're okay, but you mm -hmm. know, it's just, we need a little more cushion in there. Mm -hmm. um, but where we're sitting today is obviously, I feel good about it. Thank you. Okay. Good. All right. That's all I have for financial items. Okay. We don't have anything for superintendent, so I need a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved, Mr. President. By Mr. Kemmer, can I get a second? Second. Second by Mr. Boat. Mrs. Roberts. Mr. Kemmer. Yes. Mr. Boat. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. <coughs> Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Motion's approved. <coughs> that moves us into number five, new business section. Um, 5.1. Um, motion to approve the resignation for the purpose of retirement from Mike Myers as Director of Educational Services, effective November 16th, 2020. And that's why I sort of uh, was hesitant I, there. I tried to front load the agenda to put this <laughs> off as long as possible. Yeah. Um, I, you, you could talk for hours. Um, try not to get emotional. Uh, uh, the district will be a lesser place without Mike Myers here. And that's probably, you know, the, the best the best I could say uh, uh, in my five years I don't know that I've been around uh, an educator as passionate about kids community and district as Mike is about this place um, no matter what it is he's always the first to volunteer to jump in with both feet and 
get after it, and uh, he's been a, a, a mentor and a friend to me since I've come here, and uh, and probably more than anything, I'll, I'll miss the daily friendship and interaction, and, and uh, he's a, just an amazing person. So, uh, Mr. Myers, anything you'd like to say? Well, I was going to say, people have had to listen to me talk once already, so uh, <laughs> I, I just want to, as I mentioned in my letter, I want to say thank you to the board. Uh, you know, raising the family here. Bittersweet. Uh, personally, I'm happy for Mike, uh, uh, and knowing what it's like to be an administrator, uh, I, I'm happy for Sonia, uh, and couldn't be more sincere in that. Uh, I know the sacrifices our our significant others make uh, for us to do these jobs, and uh, uh, she she's uh, uh, just as much a part of this as Mike is over the years, and. Uh, um, I'm, personally, I'm very happy for him. Professionally, I, I, I hate seeing go. I really hate seeing go. So, uh, I very hesitantly and reluctantly recommend that we do approve uh, his letter of resignation. I just want to say that um, I must finish up close to 20 years of being a board member for being in schools and. It's, Truly been a privilege to be a board member because of an administrator like you, Mr. Myers. Um, you've served this district well. You've you've uh, taught so many young people that have looked up to you, and uh, and uh, it's truly been a privilege and an honor and, uh, uh, to be a part of this district. And and you're uh, one reason for it. So pre appreciate you. I have to say, I've looked up to him since he was a triple drummer back in the band, so <laughs> go percussion. <laughs> well, I'm not going to say much because I'll probably lose it, so um, I've known Mike and his wife all our lives, so he'll be missed. Yeah. Okay, need a motion to approve. Thank you. Sorry. 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 <laughs> 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 Gotta keep working. <laughs> so good, Mr. President. Move by Mr. Kemmer. I will second. Mrs. Roberts. Mr. Kemmer. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mr. Bope. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Motion passes. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Mike. Compose myself here. Moves us to 5.2. Motion to approve the resignation of Jax Kovach as technology support technician effective November 5th, 2020. Uh, this is another one of those you, we've kind of watched Jax grow up and uh, has just done amazing work for the district. Unfortunately, we were, we were afraid that this day would come. Uh, Anchor Hawking has stolen Jax from us. Uh, <laughs> just a tremendous job opportunity for him. And... Uh, you know, you can't, can't tell somebody not to take advantage of something that, that is just a great opportunity. So um, would recommend we approve the resignation uh, of Jax Kovac. Okay. Questions, comments? Need a motion to approve? So moved, Mr. President. <coughs> moved by Mr. Boat. Can I get a second? I'll second that. Second by Mr. Hoffman. Mrs. Roberts. Mr. Boat. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Kimmer. Yes. Mr. Smeltz. Yes, motion passes. That moves to 5.3. Motion to approve a one-year support service contract for Dwayne Collins as aid, effective October 20, 2020. Step one on the salary schedule one. Schedule I, sorry. Lori started working <clears throat> as a one-to-one -one aid last year at Pleasantville with a student and uh, was doing it on a uh, kind of a long-term basis as we were trying to uh, figure out how to best serve that young man. and. Uh, she just did amazing work. Uh, we, we now are to the point that we feel like a one-to-one -one aid for 
uh, that student is necessary and she did amazing work with with the student last year so I uh, would recommend we uh, hire her on a one-year contract to continue that work as a one-to-one aid. Okay, questions, comments? Need a motion to approve? So moved, Mr. President. Moved by Mr. Hoffman. Can I get a second? Second, Mr. President. <coughs> second by Mr. Kimmer, Mrs. Roberts. <coughs> Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Kimmer. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Bob. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. <coughs> yes, motion passes. <coughs> It was 5.4, motion to approve a supplemental per personal service contract for John Hilber as reserve boys basketball coach, salary group for 21 years of experience. Uh, excited to have Coach Hilber back uh, again this year, and uh, he just does amazing work with the basketball team and very knowledgeable, and uh, uh, so I would highly recommend we approve that contract. Questions, comments? Need a motion to approve? So move, Mr. President. Moved by Mr. Bope. I will second. Mrs. Roberts? Mr. Bope. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer? Yes. Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. Cameron? Yes. Motions approved. <coughs> Moves to 5.5. .5. Motion to approve supplemental personal service contract for Brian Funk as middle school girls basketball coach, salary group 5, 13 years of experience. Again, uh, glad to have uh, Mr. Funk back helping with the middle school once again. Uh, does a good work there, works hard for the girls, and mm -hmm. uh, just uh, excited to see him continue to build that program and help lay the foundation for the high school team. So would recommend we approve that contract. Questions, comments? You have a motion to approve? So moved, Mr. President. Moved by Mr. Hoffman. Can I get a second? Second, Mr. President. Second by Mr. Kemmer. Mrs. Roberts? Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Kemmer. Yes. Mr. Bope. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Motion is approved. Moves to 5.6. Motion to approve a supplemental personal service contract for Hannah Burnside as middle school girls basketball coach, salary group five, zero years of experience. As a coach, it's always good to have your former players come back um, because they know the program expectations. They, yep. they, they know what the varsity coach wants. And uh, uh, as, as board may remember, Hannah uh, is in the military, uh, she's now in college and, and does uh, uh, military once a month on the weekends, uh, so we do not believe that will interfere with her coaching responsibilities, but uh, just a, a bright young lady, a uh, lot of maturity, uh, having gone through basic training and those type of things, and uh, just brings a good, uh, a good sense of knowledge, and it's great to get a, a female coach into the system for our young girls to look up to and uh, have a mentor that they can relate to, both somewhat in aid. Uh, I believe Hannah will be working with the eighth grade team and preparing them for the high school. Uh, so you know, she, she understands socially, emotionally uh, what those kids are going through because she's still close enough in age, but having gone through basic training and some of her life experiences, we feel like maturity-wise she's far beyond her years and and will serve as a strong mentor for those girls in that program. So I'm excited to bring her in, and I uh, think she'll do a great job. Questions, comments? Need a motion to approve? I move, Mr. President. Moved by Mr. Kemmer. I will second. Mr. Darwin. Mr. Kemmer. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mr. Bill. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Motion's approved. Moves to 5.7, motion to approve Jared Nixon as a volunteer with Middle School Girls Basketball. Coach Nixon is a, uh, a uh, pillar of the community uh, and program. He is always there, always a part of it, and uh, uh, extremely passionate, so excited to have Jared back and continuing to work with the program. Yeah, motion to approve. So moved, Mr. President. Moved by Mr. Boe. Can I get a second? I'll second. Second by Mr. Hoffman. Mr. Boat. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Kimmerer. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Motion passes. <clears throat> Moves to 5.8. Motion to approve leave without pay for Amanda King. I had a request for Ms. King for that, and I, I would recommend we approve that leave of absence. It, it's in the spring, if I'm not mistaken. Questions, comments? Need a motion to approve? So move, Mr. President. Moved by Mr. Kemmer. I will second. Mrs. Roberts. Mr. Kemmer. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. 
Yes. Mr. Vogt. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Motion is approved. Moves to 5.9. Motion to approve uh, policy revisions as presented. I have four policy revisions, and we normally have a first reading on all policies that we're going to do revisions on. However, all four of these policies, the only changes are the ORC references. Uh, some have been added. So at the bottom of the policy, it, it'll say reference, our revised code 3301.23 or something like that. Each of these have added a reference number. That's the only change. Mm. So uh, because nothing has changed with the policy, uh, I, I did just, was going to ask the board just to approve it without a uh, first reading mm -hmm. and then bring it back in November because these policies have all been approved previously. Uh, so if you have any questions, be more than happy to answer them, but uh, no change in the policies, just the reference numbers. Anybody have questions, comments? All right, need a motion to approve? So moved, Mr. President. Moved by Mr. Boat. Can you get a second? I'll second that. Second by Mr. Hoffman, Mrs. Roberts. Mr. Boat. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Kimmerer. Yes. Mr. Smelter. Yes. Motion passed. That'll move us into number six, information discussion, 6.1. Superintendent updates, Mr. Bell. Yes, I uh, have a few items. Uh, we'll try to get through these quickly so we can get out of here there. Uh, reasonable time. I want to bring to the board's attention, uh, there's a bill going through the Senate now, Senate Bill 358, uh, that just want to bring to your attention to keep an eye on. Right now, it, it appears as if the, the House and Senate in Ohio will not go back into session prior to the election which means coming out of the election, there'll be a lame duck session. And, and that's really where we anticipate there being some movement on several pieces of legislation. The reason I bring up uh, Senate Bill uh, 358 in particular are there are some key components there that I think have a huge impact on schools. Uh, the first being that uh, Senate Bill 358 acknowledges that uh, Right now, the federal government is saying that there will be no waivers for testing this year like there were in the spring. Uh, 358 uh, mandates that the Ohio Department of Education at least request for there to be waivers. Uh, as things stand now, uh, Betsy DeVos has said there will be no waivers. The Ohio Department of Education has taken the stance that they're not going to request waivers at this time. Senate Bill 358 would mandate that ODE has to at least request, make the federal government turn us down, mm -hmm. uh, which you know may happen, but at least the request is made. If, if the testing happens, as is planned right now, Senate Bill 358 would put guarantees into place that report cards would not be issued for the next two years. It would be the 2021 school year and the 21-22 school year. Uh, the report card may look similar to what it did this year. There would be no letter grades, so testing would occur. But basically, schools uh, would have some relief from the results of those tests uh, in that the report cards would not reflect what happens in the testing. The testing would purely be used for data points for schools to see where students are in the learning process. Uh, obviously, we, we see value in knowing where our students are progressing. School districts are already doing short cycle assessments to gauge where their students are. So we contend that we're doing that on our own. We don't need high stakes testing to take away from classroom time and add another stress to students. And there's really no plan on the state level on how to administer some of these tests for students that are 100% virtual. So um, that's a big piece of 358. Senate Bill 358 also addresses Ed Choice vouchers. Uh, the piece of legislation in the spring that kind of froze Ed Choice vouchers is set to expire at the end of the year, uh, December at the end of the year. And so this would put something in place to continue the hold on voucher levels. Uh, and the great debate on the state level with vouchers are we currently have a system 
that vouchers are based on uh, the performance of schools. So with all things COVID, we can, we can fully expect it, test scores would be down. That means the number of vouchers would dramatically go up. Uh, so schools are advocating that we need to address ed choice vouchers in some fashion. It, if they are based on performance, then it becomes a very real possibility that local tax dollars would have to help send students to private schools. Uh, and a scenario uh, that we're seeing this year in public schools, and it's kind of a nightmare scenario. It's in the law now that if you have an Ed Choice voucher, that voucher stays with you till you graduate. Well, if let's say a student is in kindergarten at school A, and school A is on the list, so the kids are eligible for vouchers based on past performance, the kid gets the voucher in kindergarten. That voucher stays with the child through 12th grade. But in first grade, the student moves and ends up at school B that is not on the list. The voucher stays with the student until they graduate. School B is then on the hook to pay for the voucher, and the student never stepped foot in school B ever. But school B has to pay the voucher. Uh, schools contend that you know, not only is it unfair, uh, it just it really makes no sense. Uh, so school districts are a strong proponent of change vouchers from performance-based and funded with local money to need-based and funded completely by the state. If, if the state wants to have vouchers, fine. School choice is, you know, we have open enrollment, that is school choice. Fairfield Union is not against school choice, uh, but we believe that the state should pay for those ed choice vouchers and local tax dollars should not have to fund a voucher for a student uh, even though we're not on a list. Uh, but that's a very real possibility that a student could move into our district and we would have to pay the voucher. So uh, 358 addresses uh, ed choice vouchers as well as report cards and testing. So there's a lot in that piece of legislation uh, that could impact schools. I have reached out to our legislators uh, to uh, gauge uh, their stance on uh, Senate Bill 358. Uh, Jeff Lurie very much uh, has supported schools and uh, his stance on the report cards are very clear. Uh, as far as the Ed Choice vouchers, I don't want to put word in his mouth, but I, I do believe he is a proponent of not using local tax dollars to fund those vouchers. Same with uh, um, Senator Schaefer. Uh, again, uh, has expressed to me that he would be opposed to using local money to pay for those. So uh, I am staying in communication with our legislators and uh, will continue to advocate this. This is the same topic, if you recall, back in the spring that I did go give testimony in Columbus. So we'll continue to watch this closely. Uh, if, if they open up opportunities for testimony, uh, I would volunteer to do that again. So I'll keep the board updated on 358 as it moves, but I really don't expect anything until after the election. Um, any questions on that? And I, I can send you more information on it if you want to read about it. It's some good nighttime reading, help you go to sleep. Uh, you can let me know. Uh, tomorrow, I have an, a meeting with OHSAA uh, through uh, my BASA uh, committee. And uh, we'll be talking about all things winter sports. OHS, OHSA has uh, given the indication that winter sports will proceed as normal. Uh, some of these are a little bit easier to figure out than others. Uh, we will treat basketball very much like volleyball from the fall. Uh, we have a fixed seating capacity. We'll, have to, we'll continue to follow uh, those orders, so you know, there'll be a limit on how many spectators can go in. But OHSA's guidance has been treat basketball like volleyball. Two sports we're really uh, looking at closely and going to have to make some determinations. One is swimming. Uh, we're seeing statewide, this isn't just locally, statewide, 
the facilities that host swim meets and swim practices are not allowing visitors in at this time, like the YMCA and those places. Uh, so OHSA is looking at the possibility of moving swimming to the spring. Uh, and that's something that as a district we would have to consider as well. Uh, because we sim Coach Clark has called facilities from Zanesville to Athens to Columbus, you name it. There's nowhere around for us to get practice time, lane time, and no one is hosting me at this time. Uh, so uh, that that sport season is very much up in there. We don't know where it's going to go. Hopefully, I'll learn a little bit more tomorrow. Do we have how, girls and boys, and how many? Uh, we don't know our numbers yet because we haven't uh, we haven't uh, held signups. Uh, our coaches from last year did resign. Uh, we're waiting to post the job. Uh, it's a club sport, but those kids are allowed to compete in tournaments, so it's it's kind of a gray area. It's not really a, a school sport till we hit tournaments, and then we enter as a school in the tournament so our students can compete at districts and regional and state, those type of things. Uh, so it's not a hired position for us because it, it acts as a club, but they kind of go through us for the coaches because come tournament time, they do have to meet all the requirements that all our other coaches need to. So a little bit of a gray area. Uh, I'm not for sure how many kids we have interested at this point. We were kind of waiting to see what OHSA was going to say before we took too many steps forward. Uh, wrestling is, is the other sport that uh, is really a conundrum for OHSAA. Uh, we believe and feel that dual meets could happen reasonably safe. Uh, a dual meet is just two schools competing at one time. Uh, so really, it's a contact sport, much like football. Uh, the, the hurdle to navigate or think about is large invitations. You're bringing multiple schools together that are going to be in one place at one time. Uh, you're exposing students to multiple students, not just one specific school. So contact racing could potentially be an absolute nightmare. Um, Thursday, I do have a meeting uh, with our wrestling coaches, our uh, high school, middle school administrators, uh, Coach Clark, Coach Barr, uh, where we'll sit down and, and really kind of work through what wrestling would look like for us. One to throw it out tonight. If, if So you can start thinking about it. If you have any thoughts or opinions, please between now and Thursday, shoot me a text or an email. Um, that, that one's going to be a little bit tough just because of the close contact um, and, and having multiple schools at one point. I think that could be an issue. Uh, final, final winter sports uh, thing for consideration is our youth leagues. We are going to attempt to move forward with our youth leagues. Again, youth basketball is a little bit easier uh, a situation to deal with. They would have to follow all those same protocols as our high school teams, our middle school teams, as far as health checks with the kids, uh, limited uh, number of uh, fans in attendance at the games. Because multiple schools will be present, uh, the guidelines are very clear. Uh, if, if we're hosting youth league games, and let's say they're supposed to be four games, eight schools, uh, you would have to play the first game, you would completely clear the gym, sanitize the gym, and then bring in the teams and the fans for the next game. That's the procedure that we have to follow. We, we don't have leeway in that. We've been very upfront with that with our youth leagues that this is how it would go. Uh, I know Fuel has canceled third and fourth grade because of the logistics and and we cannot use our elementary schools to host games because our seating capacity is so limited. You base your seating capacity on the fixed seats you have. Well, our, our bleachers at the elementary schools, we'd be able to have like 20 people in attendance. So you know, each, each player couldn't even have one parent there. You know, if you have uh, 12 kids on a team, there's 24 kids and you only have 20 fans in attendance, you know, it just, 
the logistics were just too much. So I believe they've canceled third and fourth grade. We're going to try to have fifth and sixth grade boys and girls because we can utilize the middle school. They'll have to play youth league games on Sunday afternoons, which, which they've done in the past. Uh, we'll clear up as much gym time as we can on Saturdays uh, so that they can play some games on Saturday, some on Sunday, because of the time in between games to empty the gym, sanitize, and then bring them back in could be a challenge. Um, I, I've told our youth leagues that, uh, you know, with the increased cleaning protocols, uh, we were going to have to clean the gym anyway, so the district, as of right now, can handle the cleaning supplies. However, if we get into situations where our custodians are, are needing to work overtime on a daily basis, uh, because practices go till 9 o'clock, that we may have to have the youth league start helping us pay for the overtime. We're going to see how it goes to start, but we did make them aware of that up front, that, that we, we've never done that, but you know, if they're causing or helping contribute to the overtime, we're, we may need to have them help pay for it. So uh, youth wrestling, we'll know more after the meeting Thursday with our high school and middle school coaches uh, and, and talking through how this is going to look for the school because we would expect our youth leagues to follow the same guidelines and protocols that our middle school and high school teams are doing. So uh, we'll have more on that after Thursday when I have a chance to meet the coaches and get some input from them so we can make some decisions. Any questions on that in particular? Okay. I think I know the answer, but we're still going to be able to use the YouTube channel for like basketball, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Mr. Doss, uh, thumbs up. Yes. Okay. Thumbs up from Mr. Doss. So, uh, the, the goal would be uh, home right. varsity events. Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, our wrestling home meets, we would try to provide that as well. Uh, but basketball boys and girls varsity games, we would have yeah. that. Uh, Miss uh, Miss Roberts will get into this a little bit more. I'm just going to touch on a couple things with our sports teams and fundraising uh, or funding in general. Uh, you know, with all things COVID, all, all of our gate receipts are down tremendously, uh, which you know is creating a revenue need for the athletic department and our teams. Uh, advertising and fundraising in general has been brought up. Uh, so uh, I'm going to put it to the board this evening. If you want to weigh in tonight, that's fine. If you want to individually contact me over the next couple of days, that's fine as well. But just some things to think through. Uh, advertising at our home games, whether it's putting up signs uh, in the gymnasium uh, for advertising. We did some of that at the football field this year on the fence. Uh, small signs, you know, we don't want to take away from the game, from the school, from the district, but very common practice for schools, whether it's on the school board at other schools, uh, if they get a new school board, and a lot of times there's advertisement on the school board, or whether it's paying signs, uh, we'd like to consider allowing some advertising like that uh, at our home events, uh, just as a, fun, uh, a fundraising revenue stream. Uh, and then I had coaches ask about uh, if uh, we had sponsors uh, want to buy something for a program, say, um, I'll, I'll say Belleville Enterprises bought shooting shirts for the girls' basketball team, and we had a, a logo for our business, we'd want to put that on the back of the shooting shirt. Since we bought the shooting shirt, a lot of schools have moved to that over the past couple of years. I, I don't know that I'm a big fan of that, uh, putting logos on our school uniforms. Uh, I'd be more in favor of hanging a sign uh, and making announcements tonight, you know, shooting shirts were sponsored by such and such, sign on the wall, that type of thing. But uh, I, I, I told coaches I would ask, inquire the board's feelings. I said, my feelings are, I, I don't know that I want to put anything on school uniforms or shooting shirts <coughs> uh, advertising related but uh, i do think it'd be uh, a good move to hang signs in the gym again nothing huge that 
distracts from the gym or the game or anything like that. But, um, and then one final fundraiser question, uh, a fundraiser run through the athletic boosters, uh, wanted to know if they could do like a pick a square, uh, you have a football game, two teams, a square at the end of quarter, you pick a square. Um, it, some people call that gambling. It, it's not school sponsored to be done through the boosters, uh, but wanted to see how board members felt about it. We do 50-50 raffles as it is. Uh, our boosters have held uh, you know, lots of fundraisers in that, in that realm, so uh, I personally don't have a problem with the pick a square fundraiser the boosters would do, but again, just looking for some feedback over the next day or two if you have any, or if anybody wants to win the night, that's fine. Well, I've been the biggest against fundraising and advertising at our facility. Uh, it goes back to my athletic booster presidency, my bingo, running a bingo program where we had the money. Once we got lazy and didn't want to work with the bingo program to the point that we should have. They wanted to just go to advertising and get people to donate advertised materials, and I was against that because I felt that there was opportunity. Things have changed. <laughs> We're now in a new world. Uh, honestly, if, if they can get individuals to sponsor a banner at the, the gymnasium, the football field, uh, Coca-Cola, Pepsi is no longer going to be doing what they used to do, uh, which was provided with with scoreboards for all the facility uh, and compete against each other the way they used to. So at this point, with the way things have changed, I think the athletic boosters are struggling and the gate receipts are down. So if there's some way that they can generate additional dollars, I am not against it. Okay. Right. Here, here. Again, over the next here. year or two, if anybody has any other thoughts, please feel free to share. Um, Want to give an update on our current school status. We we are still in our green modified uh, status. Uh, sent that announcement out over fair break. Uh, had a lot of great feedback from our DLT members uh, as well as uh, teachers across the district. Uh, have had a lot of parents reach out to me since we went to the modified green uh, and continue to reach out to me. Had several emails over fair break. Uh, from parents and it kind of seems like we've hit a little bit of a sweet spot. Uh, teachers are, are telling me that, that the Fridays are tremendous in allowing them to make connections with the kids that are completely online, whether, whether it's a phone call to a student that doesn't have internet access um, or, you know, just being able to spend a significant amount of time answering questions uh, and giving them time to, to plan lessons and Get everything coordinated. Seems like the Fridays are working out well for students. Uh, you know, teachers have also told me that they are seeing students much more engaged Monday through Thursday, and grades are coming up. Where I, I can speak to my own two daughters, uh, I, I've seen a change in their personalities since we've gone to the modified green, uh, which just reaffirms what, what I think we all believe is kids need to be in school. Uh, you know, is there an inherent risk? Yes. Uh, but at this point, we've had the one positive case that was actually very early in the school year, and we were in the yellow hybrid model at that point. Uh, since we've come back, uh, we've had a couple of people get tested. All those tests have come back negative. I uh, want to publicly acknowledge and thank Carol Osborne for her tremendous hard work and efforts as our COVID coordinator. Uh, is just doing great things on a daily basis, as always, as Carol always does. Uh, but uh, I, I really hope and pray, and, and as of, you know, 848 on 1019, I would like to stay in this modified green status level as long as we can. Um, see how it goes. Uh, we did see the county rise up to an elevated orange status level. Um, you know, a lot of things contribute to that, uh, but uh, you know, in our zip codes, uh, specific to our district, our numbers are pretty steady. Uh, we're not seeing huge spikes in our area, so I, I, you know, I think we're in a in a good place. We'll continue to monitor things on a on a state level. Continue to have Friday meetings with the health department and other county superintendents. 
to, to stay on track with some of this stuff. So uh, I feel like we're in a good place educationally. We're seeing, seeing some movement, uh, and I'm happy about that, and, uh, and have received a lot of positive feedback over our modified green staff. So, so I don't know if board members have heard anything or have thoughts on it, but... I would just give a report on the fair, which we were concerned about the exposure coming back after the fair uh, at the shows. The, the, the parents, there were limited people there. Yeah. Uh, each individual could have four people, including their parents, uh, there to watch their show. Uh, I would say 98 to 99 percent of the folks sitting in the stands had masks on. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they did very well. Uh, Nancy said that the health department commented, commented, commented how well our fair handled the situation compared to a lot of the other fairs. So hopefully we won't see a spike coming out of the fair, but that's the one thing we were concerned about. Yeah, and uh, you know, I'm hearing similar reports. Uh, thank you to Mr. Cameron for working at the fair and, uh, and uh, Nancy, all she does. It's it's great to see the Fairfield Union ties deep and strong at the fair. But I've I've heard the same things. That, right. You know, by and large, it was it, it went off without a hitch. So it seemed to it. Yeah. We're we're excited. We'll, we'll keep a close eye on. And, and some of my words were, uh, if at all possible, keep the kids in school. Yeah. I was hearing that feedback uh, from numerous people that they appreciated us. We want to modify green and hope we would stay in that in that uh, status. Yeah. I've talked to a few parents that uh, you know we when we uh, created the modified green uh, model, we we went back and forth and we tried to make it work. Do we release early a little bit each day so we're trying to make contact daily with students at home, or do we have one whole day? And you know we went back and forth with that. The logistics. Uh, made the one whole day just uh, it just worked better for our district but over fair break I had the opportunity to talk to multiple parents who have kids in other districts um, that are following a model where they release early every day and and almost every single person whether they had a kid at Fairfield Union or not uh, said they would they would much prefer the model we're doing because they only have to come up with child care one day a week as opposed to coming up with child care every day different from what they are, you know, would normally mm -hmm. have. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, there's a hundred different ways to do this. I feel like for our community, we found something that's working fairly well. So we're going to ride this out as long as we can. Um, then uh, uh, I had two things left. Uh, one, in the reports earlier, uh, was brought up about parking lots. I uh, want to expand on that a little bit that we have students coming to parking lots to download work. I want to thank Ms. Roberts and Mr. Doss uh, through their hard work and effort. Uh, we were able to secure additional grant funds this year that are going to allow us to purchase equipment to expand our uh, internet coverage on at all of our facilities. Uh, so as it is now, when you pull up to a school, there are some sweet spots in the parking lot where you go and you have a really strong signal versus other spots in the parking lots where the signal might be a little weak or, or no signal at all if you're in a certain area. Uh, we feel like through the addition of this equipment uh, that largely uh, is paid for through the grant, mm -hmm. that we're going to be able to expand coverage on all of our facilities. 360 around the buildings. If you pull anywhere on a campus at any building, you're going to have good Wi-Fi uh, signal uh, on the Chromebook, and, and kids will be able to access that easily. Uh, I think at Bremen and Pleasantville, it will actually extend off of our parking lots a little bit, so students living fairly close will be able to access uh, the school's network through their Chromebook. Uh, so. Uh, I also feel like for this new equipment, uh, we've ordered enough that we can strategically, and I want to look to Mr. Doss and give me a thumbs down if I go wrong here, <laughs> but we can strategically place some of this equipment at the football stadium on top of the weight room, so I really feel like we're going to have Wi-Fi coverage at the land lab as well. Mm. 
uh, which we uh, wanted. Am I good with that, Mr. Doss? Is that our hope? Wait and see. Wait and see. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll continue to hope. Uh, we're going to see how far the signal goes, but we feel like by strategically placing some of these antennas that if we can get Wi-Fi out to the land lab, that just increases the ability to continue to grow that as a learning uh, outdoor classroom. So uh, we're excited about that. And again, uh, with it being a grant, the, the cost to the district was extremely minimal. So uh, very happy about that. And then uh, the last update I have, uh, over the past, I don't know, six, seven months, uh, Mr. Kimmer, uh, Mr. Furbrush, myself, uh, other board members, you know, we've been on the land lab. We, we know we have a, a big event coming next year with Covered Bridge uh, being 150 years old. Uh, but when you look at the bridge itself, we, we got the new roof put on. Uh, but when you, when you get up closer to the bridge, and I noticed it a lot as we were doing work on the smaller pond, uh, the, the paint on the bridge is really starting to chip off and peel off. And more than aesthetics, I'm concerned about preservation. Uh, I, I feel like we've gotten to the point where the bridge is in need of a couple of new coats of paint. So I uh, worked with Mr. Kimmer and Mr. Furbrush to uh, go out and uh, get me some quotes. Uh, I've attached two quotes to uh, the board agenda. Uh, I'll let Mr. Kimmer talk about those quotes a little bit more specifically and what's included. Uh, but then uh, uh, you know, both quotes are under $5,000. Uh, so I don't know that this really takes board action. Uh, and uh, depending on how the board feels about uh, this project, I'll then go to our uh, land lab committee uh, to see how they feel about it. And uh, if everybody feels the same as I do at, at that point, because of the cost, I would just authorize the expenditure. But Mr. Kimmer, if you could fill yes, in the quotes. Um, like I say, uh, we, as we uh, went out and searched for two quotes, we tried to compare apples to apples with two coats of paint, with scraping. Mr. Belleville mentioned um, uh, that we felt that was a need uh, uh, to preserve this uh, covered bridge and um, the paint. Uh, uh, we did call Sherwin Williams, our uh, representative there, and he said they felt the paint uh, that either uh, um, estimate offered was uh, would hold up for 10 years, if not 12 years. And so, um, um, in the one quote, there is a generator uh, rental, and um, um, I'm actually looking possibly of uh, asking um, if someone would donate a generator for the uh, time that they need it. Uh, the estimate said that they would um, they would deduct that from our quote. So, um, um, so we uh, we feel we got uh, say the uh, apples to apples quote and. Um, and just wanted your thoughts, and uh, um, if not, you know, we'll, like I say, as Mr. Belleville mentioned, mention it to the Land Lab Committee, and then, um, and then move forward with the uh, corner to corner uh, painting and repair with the lesser quote. So, unless there's any thoughts, considerations, please. Um, whether there are thoughts, considerations now, if you want to mention it to uh, myself, Mr. Belleville, or later, please do. Um, there's, as the time frame of the fall is, you know, uh, approaching, you know, we'll just have to see whether they accommodate this fall or in the spring. But, uh, any yeah. thoughts, Mr. Hoffman? The only difference I see on here is the one that's a little higher is, uh, shows a wood timer on any bare wood after power washing. And that's the only difference I see Correct. The two for the cost difference. So. Correct. And Sherwin Williams mentioned that, uh, the representative mentioned that um, actually he felt that the, uh, that the uh, that, uh, 100 paint that the one quote offered was maybe very, 
very, very close to the uh, pain of, of, uh, of the other quote here of the um, Sherwood Williams residence pain. So very, but they was too, uh, too quality pain. So. Well, obviously for the scoop of the same work, there's a, there's a sizable difference in the two quotes. No. Uh, you know, it, if it is apples to apples, then you would think it's reasonable to go with the, the most reasonable quote. But if you're doing something different, that would be the only consideration. Well, and as you can see, we tried to... Uh, we tried to two coats of paint. To see, you know, we did call Representative Shirley Williams and failed to book paints for uh, uh, for quality of paint, and so uh, we tried um, like say uh, scraping scraping of the bridge, and so feel that the quotes are as about as close to apples apples as we can get. So, and obviously, I would think that Comer to Comer is would be. The logical person or group to go with. I thought as well. Sure. I'll, uh, I'll uh, get this out to uh, the Land Lab Committee as well for feedback and then uh, we'll report back to the board. Thank That's you. all I have. Okay, Mrs. Roberts. Okay, so I actually mm -hmm. only have one um, topic to run through. However, it's a pretty big topic to run through this tonight. Um, over the past few board meetings, we've been bringing up the conversation of athletics. Um, one of the things that we want to look at is our athletic fund overall. So over the past 10 years, in total, our athletics department has been deficit spending, meaning we have been spending more than we have been bringing in. In total, for the past 10 years, we have overspent by $85,000. If I look at the past five years, we've overspent by $20,000. So what is going on is basically, essentially, we're eating into our savings account for athletics. So if we continue to do this for years and years and years, eventually your savings is going to run out. Well, this year, we have now hit a year with COVID where Mr. Bell brought up the fact that our revenue is very limited. You know, one of our biggest sources of revenue is ticket sales. Um, obviously, with the limited number of tickets that can be sold this year, our revenue stream is drastically decreased. So we really need to address, okay, how are we looking at athletics? How are we spending athletics? You know, what are, what's our process in athletics? So Coach Clark, Mr. Belbo, and I have really taken, um, you know, a lot of time and really looked into the athletics process, um, the funds in athletics and kind of how we need to structure things. I do think that eventually if we would have continued our current process, um, I think we would probably have this conversation eventually. However, that being said, COVID has sped this conversation up. So a few things that I want to point out. One is that the process has been done over the past few years. I think we're kind of skimming by. Um, obviously, there's been years where Revenue and expenditures have evened out. There's been years where expenditures have exceeded revenue by up to $45,000. So we've had good years, we've had bad years. Um, sport by sport has kind of been up and down. Um, but overall, what I really want to address is that our overall athletic fund is one athletic fund. All the sports receipts, all the revenue, everything goes into one fund. And what's happened in the past is that these funds are really it's been tried to look at by, from sport by sport and try to essentially keep a checkbook by sport. Way back when, at whatever point in time, it just was not set up that way. It was basically set up as an athletic fund and that is how sport should run. It's an athletic fund, it's an overall fund that basically runs the total athletic program. So what we need to address is one, how we want to run the fund go forward and how we want to address a budget process versus um, a, attempting to run a checkbook by sport. And again, what we've kind of really has stemmed this this year is that we're estimating receipts are going to be about 44% of what they've been in the past. The biggest indicator, and Mr. Belleville mentioned this, is really we're looking at volleyball receipts 
and comparing that to where we think winter sports receipts are going to come in is at the same capacity. So it's gym capacity. So basically we hit capacity with volleyball and we're really looking at what we think that could be go forward. So if we kind of run that out, we think our receipts are going to be around 44%. So last year, for example, our revenue was $156,000. If we take 44% of that, our revenue for this year, what we're estimating, and again, this is one of those things that's very tough to estimate because at any point in time, sports could stop. Um, the rules could change. Um, you know, uh, all, anything could happen. But if we're estimating kind of what we've seen at the beginning of the year and where we think the balance of the year is going to pay out, we believe revenue for this year is going to be about $68,000 versus the 156. So again, 44%. So. We started this year with $90,000 in the account. If we think we're going to get around $68,000, it gets us to just over, you know, just over $150,000. One thing to keep in mind is not only do we need to run sports for this year, but we need to be able to start the program up for next year as well, prior to receiving any of next year's funds. So from everything that I've looked at, we need to keep about $70,000 in this account in order to start the athletics up for next year. So. All of that being said, what we need to do is really look at what the process is go forward. Um, one of the things that I've worked a lot with Coach Clark on is that we really need to look at budgeting each sport. It's a budget for that year, and it does not roll into the next year. What happens to that budget then is a budget for what you think you will spend that year by sport, and then the next year you come up and you say, okay, what did we do last year? What do we think next year will happen? Um, Ideally, athletics is a self-sustaining business. It, it runs on its own and it's funded you know, through um, fundraisers, through ticket sales, through donations, um, you know, any, anything like that. So uh, we really need to, unless you're in a year where you are purposely raising money for a few years for a very large expenditure and then deficit spend in one year, we really should not be deficit spending year after year after year. So again, I think we have scraped by um, it's something that has to be addressed this year. If we do not address it, we will bankrupt our athletic fund. That's how severe it is at this point. So basically what we need to do is, I will be the first to admit it's a change of mind. It's a change of mindset of how we need to run this program. Um, we need to go in and basically, um, Coach Clark each year will meet with each of his coaches and say, okay, how much money do you think you're gonna bring in? What are you going to bring in? How does it compare to last year? And then he would essentially set budgets by sport um, that he thinks each sport needs to have. Um, we would then really need to make sure we adhere to those budgets so that we do not deficit spend again this year. Obviously our biggest expenses in, in all of athletics are really ref pay, um, security, um, athletic trainer is a big one so we're really really looking at how do we essentially make each individual sport function and what do we need to run it this year versus what do we want for this year um, so there's a lot going into this it's a big conversation um, you know and I, I it's one of those things that I think that COVID sped it up and it's the reality of where we are today um, we have to address it you know I think the more and more we have really looked at the numbers. Um, we've gone back, Mr. Balbo went back for the last five years and looked at every single line item expense and revenue by sport. And we have really analyzed what sports have brought in, what sports have spent, what, um, you know, how are we doing in a, as an overall athletics program. Um, and I think the good news is, is if we are very on budget this year and really only do what we need to spend in order to make the sport run, we will be fine. Um, but we need to address it now, and we need to be very upfront about it now because it's, unfortunately, it's very black and white as to what needs to kind of happen before work in order to um, make it through this year and then have, a, have sports for next year. So I realize this is a lot of information. Um, there's a few other pieces that are playing into this. One is I talked about budgets versus a rolling kind of checkbook balance. The other piece is that we need to discuss fundraisers. We have talked to athletic boosters about taking over fundraisers instead of running fundraisers through the district. Um, and then I mentioned it also, it needs to be self-sustaining business, meaning we need to operate on the revenue that we're bringing in and then the cash balance that we have. So a few things, I think the major changes are really the budget piece versus the cash balance piece. 
and also the decision on what we need to make with fundraisers. Um, you know, we've talked a lot with the boosters um, and how we want to run fundraisers, and there's still some details that need to be figured out. And before we would officially, you know, kind of turn things over to that group, um, I really appreciate them willing to step up and kind of help us out. You know, my view is that we're in, we're running a business together, um, and we're just addressing different needs of the business. So. I really appreciate their help um, and their kind of, you know, their upfront willingness to, to work with us um, and say what's best for our athletes and how do we want to fund this program. Um, we obviously do need to figure out a few more details before we officially turn fundraising over to them, um, but it is an option that's out there that we've been addressing. So um, overall, I realize it's a lot of information. It's a lot of high-level information. We have a lot of details. I'm more than happy to, you know, give details. Um, but I kind of wanted to keep it high level from an overall discussion standpoint and ask if there's any questions, any thoughts. I realize that the change of thought or a change of, you know, kind of how we're going to run this. Um, I think we are all on board uh, as far as Mr. Belvo, Code Clark, and myself. Um, but it's going to take some work and it's going to take some cooperation and some understanding of where we are today versus where we've been in the past and how we want to run things go forward. <coughs> Well, Mrs. Roberts, I think we have to. We have to face reality. I mean, we can't have the, we can't have the, uh, an athletics bankrupt. So if we make changes, it's got to be done. Yeah. Well, this local level is no different than the college level. And you look at the college level in Ohio State starting football this next week, and there's going to be maybe 15,000 people in the stadium compared to 110,000, and they're the general revenue money maker for uh, Ohio State University. Football primarily is one of our big ticket items. Fortunately, we've had some, but it would have been such reduced individuals that numbers that we can't generate anything. So we really can't gauge where we're going to go by this year. I think you can look back at past years when we didn't, didn't have COVID. Uh, and realize that without the athletic boosters being very active and generating expense money for the program, uh, that our school budget isn't enough to sustain those programs the way they are. So, I mean, we're going to have to work with the athletic boosters. Uh, like I said, I fought the advertising back many years ago. Uh, golly, that's way too long ago. We won't get into that. Uh, <laughs> but. Now I think we have to figure out any way that we can generate dollars uh, to fund those activities and those sports because we can't expect the school itself out of our budget to fund those programs by themselves. Right, and I think that's where we're really saying that like, it is a partnership. It's a partnership and we, we address different needs of the program. Um, you know, the school may be addressing the needs of what do we need to make this program just function. Like yeah, facility, we, electricity, exactly. uh, rep, uh, officials, uh, the trainer, those are the, finally the, the functions of the, the school system. Uniforms, uh, a lot of the extras should be the responsibility of the athletic boosters. Yeah, and I think we'll, the pieces of that we really need to look at too are just when we're looking at these two funds, whether it's through this district or it's through the boosters, it's an overall athletics fund. Right. It is not a sport by sport <clears throat> fund. Um, I mean, if you think of it, some sports bring in ticket sales and other sports don't, but we're still funding those sports. Sure. And that's just the nature of it. That's to your point, the same with Ohio State. It's right. the same concept. It's the same, you know, everybody's kind of functioning in the same way. So we can't look at it sport by sport. We mm -hmm. have to look at it as a total fund, fund mm -hmm. and how we're running our athletics program overall. Um, you know, I know fundraising is a, a big topic and I think it's something that, you know, when you're fundraising, unless you're fundraising for a long-term product, which is fine if that's the purpose of a fundraiser up front, if you're fundraising for something that money should be spent that year on those athletes. So we, we need to look at a budget for that year versus our rolling balance, um, and you know we need to address that as, as how are we how are we looking at athletics as a total, um, and I think you know I, we appreciate all the hard work that's been done by the coaches and the athletes and the parents and and you know without that we wouldn't even have the funds we have today, so we're lucky enough that even though over the past you know ten years like we said that we've been in place we're lucky enough that we've at least 
had a good base. Um, and unfortunately, we're now at a point that COVID has sped the conversation up. And it's just, you know, to your point, we have to address it. Um, so I think, you know, we are fine if we address it now. Um, and if we kind of, you know, make some changes now, I think we'll be in a good spot for the year and then to the start up next year, which hopefully the next year it'll be <laughs> different conversations. But I mean, you never know, we have to be careful in case it's not, because you just, we don't know. Um, so any other? I think one thing that's going to kind of hurt is uh, I know our athletic fees low, lowest of most any school, and we're proud of that. Proud that it's low. It is, and when we look at it, we've consistently been bringing in right around ten thousand dollars into athletics from the pay-to-play fees, um, because a piece of that goes into. It, it, it gets funded in different ways. So we've been bringing around ten thousand dollars. Some years it's around nine. Some it's around ten thousand five hundred. So it's steadily been around ten thousand. Obviously, we have to throw a piece of last year out because we had to refund a lot of the pay to pay from the spring. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't really look at last year. But even last year, with that, was still right around ten because it was it was only mm -hmm. a portion of the of the pay to play fees that we had to refund. So that out of anything is actually what we. Can determine mm -hmm. if we have mm -hmm. if we have you know all sports and everything, but um, but yes, I would agree. I mean it yes. it, it is low, mm -hmm. um, but we've been able to function where it is. Um, but you know it's, it's something to everything else be considered. Yes. Anybody, yeah, if anybody has any other, after, you know, I know, I really, like I said, I realize it's a lot of information. It is a mindset change. So if there's any other thoughts, I'd be happy, you know, if you want to um, shoot me an email or anything like that, I'd be happy to send more details or whatever anybody needs as, if any questions come up. But um, I do feel good about the game plan we have going forward, and I think it's now, you know, working together to kind of execute the plans and, and figuring it out for the rest of this year. So. Mm -hmm. <coughs> All right, that will move us into Section 7, closing items, reminders. Next meeting will be Monday, November 2nd in the high school cafeteria. Nothing else? I need a motion to adjourn. So move, Mr. President. Move by Mr. Boat. Can I get a second? Second, Mr. President. Second by Mr. Kemmer. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Boat. Yes. Mr. Kemmer. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Seltzer. Yes, this meeting is adjourned.